Hello, hello. Welcome to Friday. Happy hour, everybody. How are you? How has your week in Strata been? I would love to hear from you. If you are coming in, you are here for your Strata property, four o'clock, Friday happy hour. Have you come bearing your drink of choice? Uh, yes, it is wine for me today. It is white wine with a little bit of lipstick. I'm just <laughs> seeing in the, in the camera there. Uh, let me know. Let me know that you are here. Give me a thumbs up. Say hello. I'm really excited to see you this week. Uh, we're still coming off a little bit of a high after last week, I think, when we were chatting to Chris Duggan, SCA New South Wales president. So, so many of you here to listen to Chris. I think I haven't gone back to check, but I think we've had about 2000 odd views of that video since we went live last Friday. So lots of good stuff in there to be hearing from Chris. I actually uh, edited a little bit of that happy hour down and created episode uh, podcast episode number 210, which went out on the podcast this week. So the interesting thing about that becoming a podcast is that you now have the access to the transcript of that happy hour as well. Some of you have been asking me, can we get happy hour transcripts? Uh, I, I'd love to. Uh, I get lots of requests every week for can we please have, may we have, this would be really helpful. Uh, it is hard to do it all, I will tell you that. But the benefit of turning some of our happy hours into podcast episodes is that we do get a transcript for you. So uh, I know my team is going to pop into the comments section here a link to Chris's uh, happy hour episode which is now a podcast episode and you'll be able to get access to the transcript of that there too uh, so if you're coming in give me a hello I am seeing Natalie who says that she has vodka lime and soda with a few mint leaves sounds lovely I keep telling myself that I'm going to have time on a Friday afternoon to put together a really fancy cocktail and it just doesn't happen so nice to live vicariously uh, Ronnie Ronnie says that's the way chin chin lovely to see you. Uh, if you're coming in, drop me a hello. Let me know how you are today, what you might have brought to happy hour. And as always, we are going to have time for your strata questions, for, for me to answer your pressing strata questions, whether it's about COVID or it is just about general strata issues, which I know you all have. So have a think about those. If you want to start popping them into the comments or just reserving them for when we get there. I am seeing Jane, hello and happy Friday to you too. Henry, good afternoon, Henry and hello. Hello, Anne. Hello, Anthony, lovely to see you. Hello, Nathan. Uh, I am in a different spot today. If you've been joining into my happy hours on a Friday, you'll know that uh, the finishing up of daylight saving put a spanner in my works and I started to get some western sun that was gradually setting as we went along. So I'm in a different spot, getting a bit better light here. So we'll see how we go. I hope I don't disappear. I do have a very special guest for you today and I will be welcoming her in very, very soon. Uh, but first up, I do want to run through a few important uh, points for you, things that have been happening this week, as I like to do at the beginning of happy hour. Um, we have a couple of new resources over on our covidandapartments.info webpage. That is the information hub that I have set up for you where I am putting resources relevant to Strata and COVID, the need to know, the guides, the fact sheets, the links to the websites that I think are going to help you as Strata owners, as managers during this time. And it was drawn to my attention that we have, I'm not sure when this came out, whether it was this week, you guys will tell me, I'm sure. Uh, Kelly and Partners in conjunction with the SCA have put together a federal government stimulus measures guide for strata managers okay so this is a short summary of those federal government financial uh, measures helpers the the tools the boosts the cash flows the loans the things that our strata buildings may be some of our buildings may be entitled to access particularly if you're a building that has employees so uh rochelle um i think is going to pop the link to uh, our covid and apartments.info page in the comments here and uh head over there and you'll see the top two in the list uh first of all is the kelly and partners Federal Government Stimulus Measures Guide, check that out. And then secondly, SCA has put out a discussion paper 
on the impact of solvency of strata corporations. Uh, so that is quite a detailed paper that canvases a range of solutions to alleviate the financial pressure on strata corporations, including some calls for government assistance, uh, where we can have some key stakeholder participation, where we might be able to have some legislative relief when it comes to the financial impacts on our strata corporations. So as I understand it, that's a discussion paper that has been put together for government. So you'll see a link to that over on our page. Definitely check that out. Uh, as I understand, that's something new that has come out recently as well. Uh, I am seeing Bruce, hello. I'm seeing Michelle who has just plain old wine. There is nothing wrong with just plain old wine. Michelle, does yours have some lipstick on it? Uh, hello to Megan. Uh, hello to Christine. Lovely to see you. Frank, hello. You're saying the reception is not great. Uh, I hope that's not my end, Frank. I hope I'm coming through clear. Uh, Dixon, a uh, very educated podcast with love from Kenya. Hi, Dixon, all the way from Kenya. How cool is that? I know that we have some overseas subscribers and listeners to the podcast, and it's fabulous to see you here on the Facebook Live. Awesome. I am just trying to, I'm on my laptop today, and I'm trying not to use my touchpad because I might accidentally cut us off. So I'm just heading over to my mouse here. All right. So a couple of other things I want to bring to your attention before we bring on our special guest. Um, we have some new law, not specific to strata. Uh, I'll get to that later, actually. Uh, but we have some new law around electronic document signing that I think is relevant to us as uh, strata managers and owners who might need to sign contracts, in particular uh, agency agreements during this time. Uh, it's relevant to the witnessing of documents. Uh, again, I have a link there for you and I can't see all the links that are going in through my team, but uh, if they're not there, I will definitely be back to put all these links in for you. Uh, it is the electronic transactions amendment regulation relevant to COVID-19 and the witnessing of documents. So where a document may need to be witnessed, where a signature on a document may need to be witnessed, we can now conduct that witnessing via audio visual link. How cool is that? You can actually witness the signing of a document by a video call. Um, I think that's really cool. And as far as I'm aware, that will be relevant to strata managers who have to attest the affixing of the seal uh, and strata committee members who are signing um, the agency agreement and maybe the strata manager is holding the seal and they may be attesting the affixing of the seal. So uh, that's just come to my attention. I think it started a couple of days ago. Uh, I'll be interested if anybody has thoughts on that or has had a closer look at it, um, but I will definitely be doing that within the next week to make sure that we're fully fleshed out the impacts of the electronic transactions amendment regulation of 2020 on our strata schemes. So uh, I mentioned that that was uh, a change in legislation not specific to strata, but we have had a change in legislation that is specific to strata. I've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. It is in New South Wales, our new section of the Strata Schemes Management Act, section 137A, which allows our strata buildings to pass a bylaw preventing what I call for short investor owners from short-term letting in the building. So very interesting to many of you, that started on the 10th of April. Uh, and as I have posted on a couple of my social media channels, and if you are on my email list, you definitely would have heard about this. I do have a template bylaw for you if you want to incorporate this new provision into your bylaws, if you are concerned about regulating short-term letting at this particular time, then I do have a template for you. Uh, the link Link, if you want to check out that template is yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash bylaw offer. That is where you can get access to the template. And also as a little PS, I am letting you know that you'll find on that page, the doors to the membership are open. Okay, so a little tip there for you. 
yourstarterproperty.com.au forward slash bylaw offer. We'll get that link in the comments for you. Uh, opened up the doors to the membership because the wait list was growing and had grown rapidly the last couple of weeks in particular. So I was hearing from you that you wanted access, you wanted to be able to get access to the Q&A forum to ask me those one-on-one -on -one questions specifically about COVID and your other pressures that you're facing in your schemes. Um, so I opened up the doors a little bit earlier than I had otherwise planned. Um, I've already seen, I've got a bit of a list here for you of our, our new members and I'm wondering if a couple of you might even be here. Uh, today we've welcomed Matthew, Andrew, Michael, Savia, Craig, Grant, Julie, Frank, Anthony, Chris, John, Carol, Leo, Philip, Gillian, Francis, Nick, Welcome all our new members inside the community. The doors are gonna be open until midnight on Sunday. That's midnight uh, standard, Eastern standard time. Uh, so check out that link. You'll see the bylaw offer there, um, but the hot tip is you get better value joining the membership than just buying the one-off template. So definitely check that out. Alrighty, so I am heading over to say hello to Rita. Uh, Frank is saying reception is much better now. Um, uh, no problem. Uh, I'm saying hi to uh, Donovan, uh, Sean. Sorry, did I say hi? We've got two two Sean's. Uh, we have awesome. Sounds like romper room. Yeah, I've heard that before. Should I stop doing that? Do you want a romper room? I want to say hi to you. I love to see you. I'm missing my people. Great to have you all here virtually. All righty, now we are all warmed up. We are ready for our special guest. Our very special guest for happy hour today is Veronica Morgan. Veronica is the founder and principal of Good Deeds Property Buyers. She is also the co-host of the popular series Location, Location, Location Australia with Bryce Holdaway and also Relocation, Relocation Australia on Foxtel's The Lifestyle Channel. I do call Veronica a bit of a TV star. She doesn't like it when I say that. It's embarrassing. You can also tune in to Veronica as she co-hosts the Elephant in the Room property podcast, hugely popular podcast that has been running, I think, for a couple of years now. And on that podcast, Veronica investigates who is really in control when you are buying property. Veronica is passionate about residential real estate and knows firsthand the importance of owning and living in the right property. Prior to jumping the fence and becoming a buyer's agent, she was an acclaimed sales agent in a leading independent agency in Sydney's inner west. Since forming Good Deeds Property Buyers in 2009, Veronica has become a credible and often, she says, controversial, that's why I love her, source of opinion on Sydney's property market. She regularly co-hosts on Your Money Auction Day, has presented at Grand Designs Live Australia, been an REI New South Wales Awards judge, a keynote speaker at REI New South Wales Women in Real Estate Conferences, served as Vice President of REBA and written numerous articles for mainstream and industry publications. And this year, very exciting. Veronica released her first book, which is called Auction Ready, How to Buy Property at Auction, Even Though You Are Scared Shitless. Love it. Love the title. Love Veronica. I am bringing her in right now, turning that mic on. Welcome, Veronica Morgan. <laughs> Hello. I sound, so, I sound so busy, don't I? <laughs> uh, I think that's because you are, love. I know you and you are. You are. <laughs> I don't know. I Lovely think you're busier than me. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to have you with us on today's happy hour. Thank you. First, very important question. What are you drinking? Oh, yes. I've actually got a Peterson Chardonnay, which I literally just raced to the wine fridge and went, quick, what's cold? Um, yes. Hunter yeah. Valley Chardonnay. I'm not really big on Hunter Valley Chardonnays, but this is very nice. Good. Good to hear. Do enjoy that. If you need a refill, it's okay. We can hold the fork oh, thank for you. you. I've got um, lipstick too, by the way. Yeah, that's no, a girl thing. Uh, well, it could be a guy thing, whatever you're into. That's all fine. <laughs> all types. All righty. Now, uh, amongst that, that very busy uh, bio that I read out there, uh, the key takeaway there, I think, for me is that you are indeed a buyer's agent. Your uh, business is called Good Deeds Property Buyers. And what I wanted to ask you today, Veronica, is what changes have you seen when it comes to buyer behaviour over the last few weeks? Are people running scared when it comes to real estate or uh, are we hearing that with rock bottom prices and excellent interest rates, are they jumping right in? 
It's a mix, actually. You know, you've seen people skidding to a halt. You know, they're running full pelt, then it's a stop. Um, and some people have to stop because obviously they're in businesses or they work in industries that are impacted. And so we've got, we have had a couple of clients that are in the travel industry, for instance, and, you know, they've just went, right, our search is on hold. Um, what we've seen also is that there's a, there's quite a number of owner occupiers who are saying, you know what, I still need to upgrade. I still need to downsize. I still need to, you know, life is going to go on. In fact, you know, I'm now at home with my kids. I'm now home with my husband. We're all working and learning and playing and everything in the same environment. Oh my God, my house is too small. Or my apartment is too small. And so there's this interesting pressure. And and those people are like, you know, like, okay, well, wait a minute. We'll just sit back and think, what's happening? And I think I really am seeing some some signs of people just saying, you know, life is going to go on, mm. you know, life is going to continue after this and we need, still we need somewhere to live and we need to have the right environment. So there's sort of that sort of buyer. Then you've got the sort of the shark circling. You've got those opportunistic buyers who are saying, right, this is great. We're going to be, you know, you're going to be a fleece. All these people are going to be desperate sellers. And I have to say that, look, there are some areas that potentially maybe six months down the track we might see some forced sales but it's not going to be widespread and I think they might be a bit disappointed or they might go and buy a lot of crap because a lot of stuff that is bargain, that there's a bargain isn't necessarily worth buying. So you've got this sort of mixed bag of reaction, uh, if you like. I think there's been a lot of price sensitivity that's, that's kicked into the market, though, because people are thinking, well, if it does fall off a cliff, I don't want to overpay now. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an element of that as well. Yep, and and but there's not there's not much in the way of actual new listings coming on the market, and there's a mixed bag as well. On the flip side of that, in terms of owners who may or may not be panicked um, and maybe caught in the crossfire, so those who maybe have bought, um, yep. thinking, oh, I can I can sell. You got to remember, clearance rates at the beginning of March were over eighty percent. Mm. So, you know, so people who thought, oh, well, we're easy to sell you know, and they're bought on that strength and they mm. haven't necessarily got themselves a good contingency plan or backup in terms of finance. So, but there's not a lot of people like that out there in terms of selling their property. So yep. I think people, I, buyers are getting used to the idea that, oh, it doesn't mean there's going to be bargain city. Yes, I think you're right. And uh, the inability to hold public auctions or at least not in person and open for mm. inspections, I imagine if you're a vendor ready to list, that's going to be uh, something that holds you back. Uh, I know yeah. there were a few quite successful auctions in that, that the first week that we had our online auctions, but they seem to have maybe gone a bit quiet or uh, fallen a bit flat lately. I don't know if you're following those. Yeah, look, I am. And and mm. it's interesting. It's, it's an unfamiliar... Um, Mm. environment for buyers to be buying online or be buying via live streaming it's difficult enough let's face it it's why I wrote the book mm. <laughs> you know it's difficult enough in a normal auction environment to work out what's going on and what you should do but mm. then when you're sitting at home or you're on you're on your iPhone or, or whatever watching something and bidding the lack of transparency is actually very daunting for buyers. I think buyers don't realise that a public auction is very transparent for them. Is one that one of the main benefits of buyers. Mm. So that is gone, and you might be okay bidding for stuff on eBay, but bidding for a home or an investment property in this way, there are other the more sophisticated platforms as well. So some auction auction houses, well, there's a couple of quite sophisticated platforms that are available, but most are really just very unsophisticated, literally a live stream. Mm. Um, you know, those more sophisticated ones, have, have they have things built into them to actually encourage you and, and play on all your behavioural biases to actually bid more as well. So, oh. you know, they reset timers, for instance. So if, if there's a, another bid, they might have a deadline for the final bid and whoever's the, the last bidder you know, will buy the property as long as it's over reserve. But they've often got these little mechanisms built in to say if someone actually places a bit in the last five minutes, they'll reset the timer. They'll give another 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. So so this can go on for a long time and you're sitting there wow. and if you are sitting at home with your glass of wine, you know, you're not doing that at a normal auction. You know? Right, yes. So <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you have people around you who might be um, giving you advice and yeah. guidance and pressure and... 
uh, filling up the wine glass and mm, yes. So sometimes having more time to think about your decisions is a good thing. Other times mm. it's not such a great thing. So it, it and I, I just think fundamentally people are quite uncomfortable with that. So you might hear some news or some some you know via social you hear some great stories of great outcomes and and in, from the vendor's point of view. But you're not going to hear all the other ones that fall fall on their face. And the clearance rate, let's face it, which has been a, let, let, I mean, the clearance rate's been under 40% since. Mm, yeah. However, you've got to realise all those properties that were taken off auction and had a price put on them, they've, they're not count, they're counted as um, passed in effectively. So it, the, the clearance rate's not exactly accurate at the moment. It's no longer a, me a measure of the market. Mm. But I just think the fact that very few sell successfully at auction means that agents typically don't want to take it to auction they're going to do whatever they can do to actually get it sold prior so there's there's a whole nother kit bag of dialogue and ways in which they're encouraging buyers to make offers yeah well from, from a, a long-term perspective I'm, I'm interested in hearing you say uh you know people may be uh for quite some time now concerned not to be spending too much money mm. and this uh, mentality that we've had particularly my generation is one of them uh, in particular suburbs of Sydney to say borrow as much as you can don't worry about the debt you got mm. high incomes uh, you, the value will increase and then something like this happens and somebody loses their job or yeah. the income is not there anymore uh, that could be terrifying if mm. your debt levels are high so I think it's going to be re really interesting to see that play out people make different purchasing decisions when it comes to how much they're comfortable to risk, um, knowing that the world can come to a screeching halt very quickly. Yep. Very much so. And I think too, um, even just when it comes to actually mortgage strategy, and that's one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot on the podcast, um, and it's interesting setting buffers. And, and so you've got the, you know, learning about, I guess we all need to be um, fiscally more literate, you know, and mm. I think that when you, when we are confronted with situations like this, we think, oh my God, if only I'd actually set things up differently or there are options to the way I've done it. I just sort of thought you do it this way, but now I'm actually realising there were options and, and that's very important. And I'll give one example. I guess an, an option is where setting up an offset account. So somebody might've thought, look, I'm just going to keep paying the money off the mortgage and so they no longer have that flexibility to draw on that money if they lose their job and to be able to pay pay mortgage repayments out of the offset account. So there's there's lots of different ways of structuring your borrowing. Now, obviously, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think there's you know there's that aversion to 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 risk or aversion to carrying a lot of debt. And I think yes. that it's good to have these timely re reminders, really, because I think that. Um, a lot of people, I mean, I am, you know, I'm not going to admit my age here, but I do remember the last recession. Right. <laughs> and um, I was out of school for the last recession. And, um, you know, a lot of people my age go, oh, you young people, you don't remember that stuff. You know, it's like, well, God, you know, it, it might be true, but the reality is the circumstances were a bit different. But the thing is that we, if you have had sort of hard economic times or you've witnessed hard economic times with other people, at least if it's not you, have been impacted by that, you're a little bit more likely to remember to be a bit careful. So it's not a bad thing in, in a lifetime to, mm. to experience this. Mm. Uh, I'm just seeing Jane post here saying that she felt very lucky to sell her house in Melbourne with a 30-day settlement. They were only on the market for three weeks, slightly lower price, but only slightly. Well, good on you, Jane, for accepting mm. that slightly lower price. Good decision indeed. Um, when it comes to apartments, Veronica, something that I wanted to ask you in particular, uh, and I've seen a little bit of media about this, um, off the plan sales. Uh, I don't know how many of your clients over the years have been interested in purchasing apartments off the plan. Uh, already for the last 12 months, <laughs> we've been talking about uh, the building defects mm. crisis uh, and the dangers of buying off the plan. I've been on your podcast talking about it. Dr. Nicole Johnston's been on your podcast. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if this, um, you know, the, the instability in the world and, and the example that's been set here of what can happen in an instant uh is that going to kill the off the plan market do you think do you think already it was on shaky ground and now people are just not going to take the risk of putting money into something a deposit buying at a price and then waiting to see what the world might look like two years later well i do hope so <laughs> but, <laughs> but i think sometimes we have short memories and um i look i even saw I guess I was doing some some talks to first home buyers probably a year, maybe eighteen months ago. God, 
Opal Towers was just over 12 months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, so maybe a year ago I was doing some some um, some talk. I do regularly, I do talks to first home buyers and I'd be asking the question, so how many of you are thinking of buying brand new and not one person will put their hand up? Now, a year earlier or even six months earlier, half the room would put their hand up yeah. because the a lot of that new depart, new apartment market and the new house and land package market, of course, that's not so much your, your, um, your listeners here um, or your community, but certainly that sort of stock has been heavily marketed at first home buyers as a way to get into the market. And so it was just interesting to see that they were really like, whoa, no way, there's no way. However, even towards the end of last year, when the market starts moving again, when they feel the pressure, they're being priced out of the market um, by, the, by you know, other more cashed up buyers. And certainly we saw that towards the end of 2019, you know, when I did uh, started doing some some talks asking that question, I started seeing that a few hands were creeping up again. Oh, yes, I'm thinking about buying off the plan. So I think it's a very short memory. And also you've got to remember when it comes to property, when people enter the market, they haven't necessarily been paying attention to what's been happening. And so everyone's sort of an expert in their little bubble of time, but no one's actually got that longevity and no one's got that sort of long lens to be able to look back and forward. And I think that's a big danger uh, with off the plan because I, I do think that, um, you know, that there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of dollars going to marketing off the plan as well. And particularly with investors, it, it's so much um, oh, I guess it's, it's it, it, smoke and mirrors, really. Oh. And. So, yes, I would like to think that buyers will be much more aware of what all of the risks are, you know, and certainly you've got settlement risk, you've got change of circumstance risk, you've got the simple fact and the settlement risk is multifaceted because, of course, now you've got this situation I guess you're alluding to is that you're assuming your job's still going to be there in two yep. years or time or however you know however long a time it yep. takes. You're assuming bank policy isn't going to change. You're assuming APRA is not going to get involved in, until the banks have stopped lending. You're assuming the property is worth what you paid for it, the contract that you signed yep. for it. That's the big the scary thing. Yeah. And, it you know, what be. you're told also because they price these new properties very differently to the way that they actually pro- you, you buy an existing property down the street. Um, we actually had... A, we haven't yet launched this episode, but we interviewed um, a valuer or the head of valuation for JLL um, the other day, and yeah. it was just really interesting talking about why, what, what goes into the valuations of a brand new property versus an existing property, and the high level of risk, and generally speaking, that they were overpaying. Um, and so you got you you need that to stack up, but they can't use other brand new sales as evidence that you've paid the right price. And yet, when you're being marketed to. You, you're given a price. It's like buying a, you know, cartload of milk off the off the in the supermarket. It's the price is the price. That's pretty much mm. how all this new stuff is sold. So yeah, it's it, it's very concerning. So I'm hoping that that the message will get out there. But you've also got to remember that the, what's bigger than us is the fact that governments want the construction industry to be very active. Mm-hmm. There's lots and lots of reasons why, um, you know, it's a big employer. They get a lot of tax, you know, they get taxed at every level of government from brand new developments. And, you know, so there's that, that the governments actually want more construction of new property mm. and new apartments. And unfortunately, though, it's the individual owner, the bottom of the heap that buys into it, that carries all of the risk. So yeah. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but it, it's just such a, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't believe long term that yeah. this will solve the problem. <laughs> Look, I, I hope you're preaching to the converted and it's something that I, I say a lot um, to my community. Uh, beware off the plan, beware new. The concerning thing for us at the moment, uh, having seen Mascot Towers back in the news again last week, <sighs> is that that's a 10, 11-year-old building or, or, or was when it experienced its uh, devastating cracks that left everybody on the street. Mm. Um, you know, the, the media reports are now that the, the bill ultimately is going to be in excess of 50 million dollars once you take into account the interest on the strata loan and the interest on strata loans is eight or nine percent they are unsecured loans that is just sickening i have to say what there's 40 apartments in that building right i think it's about 60 odd but you know what whoever's here today will (laughs) pop it in the comments for us you might know yeah yeah and and so if you look at that i mean i I know that not everyone has the same uh lot entitlement so some people will have a lesser obligation than others but basically i would gather without knowing the individual apartments that every single person is going to be up for more money than their apartment is worth 
Yes, I would say that would be the case because mm. uh, the market value of those apartments at the moment. Mm, but even before this, yeah. I wouldn't have thought a two-bedroom apartment in Mascot Towers, for instance, it would be worth a million dollars mm, or yeah, 800000 or yeah. whatever. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and it is, as we've talked about on your podcast, Veronica, uh, the, this concept of unlimited liability that travels mm. with our owners' corporations. Mm. Uh, owners are not exposed to the value of their property. They are exposed to the extent of their assets, mm. uh, to the extent of the assets that are held by the owner. Uh, and some owners, some people might be in the habit uh, or have received advice to purchase property in their super funds. Mm. Uh, that is kind of scary when you think about uh, buying a apartments in owners corporations with unlimited liability that all the entire assets of your fund are exposed yeah. um, so I'm not sure you know we talked about it as an elephant on your podcast mm. Veronica I'm not sure that too many people who buy into strata are aware of that concept of unlimited liability and ultimately uh, or I should say you know the vast majority of cases uh, it's not an issue we, we mm. pay our levies there may be some big bills that come up uh, we pay to do repair and maintenance to do improvements the value of our property increases but I think the mascot tower situation uh, is a really unique one. Uh, it is, uh, a, as well as a devastating one from a legal perspective, it is a fascinating one. Mm. Uh, that we don't see that play out all that often, these huge bills that owners may not be able to pay. And what does happen if an owner can't pay, goes bankrupt, a trustee in bankruptcy is appointed, uh, can't sell the property because no one's going to buy it. Um, one thing that uh, I, I hope, and I, I can say this quite freely, as I say, um, I've said to you before, I'm as educated as anyone else who reads the news articles on this. I'm not involved as a practitioner in, in the um, in the building. Uh, I wonder if they, there are discussions about a collective sale and whether there are developers who would uh, be able to purchase the site at, at some price that uh, owners can be comfortable with. Um, it would seem to me that that's an avenue well worth exploring for that building i think there'd be some sharks circling mm, yep um and that might be a godsend for them really i mean that's mm. the lesser of two evils yeah um i was scrolling through your uh, facebook feed recently veronica and i saw a heading uh, I, I really wanted to click into it but i thought no i'll save it for our chat uh do apartments increase more in value than houses uh i didn't read through can you give us the answer to that I think what's there's there's a real perception amongst property investors that um, houses go up more than apartments do, and mm -hmm. the reason for that is because the it's the land content that appreciates and the building itself depreciates. So if you think of it a bit logically, you think okay, well you know if, if there's a big parcel of land with a small house, mm -hmm. it's going to go up in value more than an apartment block on a on a small block of land. Um, the problem is that a lot of people have this perception, and weirdly enough, I actually don't think I've actually uh, tackled it this way in, the, in that article you referred That's to. All right. but, a, um, a lot of people have the perception that, okay, that therefore I've got to buy a house. But what they're not understanding is that it depends where that land is located as to whether it's worth more or not. Mm. So if you have, say, for argument's sake, a um, say you're in Bondo Beach, okay, Um Bondo Beach, very expensive land. You might have a, you might own an apartment in an old red brick building, uh, or you might own an apartment in an Art Deco building, and you would compare that maybe to a house that you might buy for the same amount of money. And say you might buy that house in a suburb like um, I'm just plucking out of the air, say Bankstown, which is further out from the city. It might be the same amount of money, um, but the land value in Bankstown is not as expensive as the land in Bono Beach. So it could be that you buy an asset or a house in Bankstown. Oh, look, I'm just picking Bankstown. It could even be in um, Balmain. Like you yeah. could, like a, a blue chip in a west suburb, you could buy a house maybe for the same price as an apartment in Bono Beach. Yeah. But you'd be buying, if you bought a house in Balmain for the same sort of money, it would be highly compromised. It would not be a very good house. And so if it was a tiny, tiny house on a tiny, tiny block of land that could never be made any bigger or it's on a on a busy road uh, or has all these sort of negative things around it, it actually won't go up in value at the same rate as a really good apartment in Bondo Beach mm. or even a really good apartment in Balmain for that matter. 
Mm. But I'm talking about from an investor point of view, you could spend the same amount of money on two different assets. You could believe that you're getting a better asset because you're buying a house, but you could actually be buying an asset that doesn't go up as much as an excellent asset in a really good location. Mm. And so much. I mean, there are just so many facets at play here. And I think when we're buying property, we're not attuned to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's about position, regardless of the, of the type of property. It's about, as you're saying, where it's located. Uh, the, the scarcity, I mean, you may have, I mean, three bedroom apartments with uh, ocean views at a certain level in a certain age of building. I think, I hope that those who are looking at strata are becoming more attuned to that. The age of the building is so important. Uh, if there ain't many of those, then you're certainly gonna see those in a particular area, as you say. Um, that will increase more in value over time than houses will. And that's exactly right. I mean, I think that um, the, the scarcity is so important and in a, in a way that's linked to land value as well and that, the you know, where land is scarce, it is mm. more valuable. So that's that's part of that principle. But, yes, the style of architecture. Uh, I think there there is, I think three bedroom apartments is a good example. They are scarce really in the whole scheme of things and yet as affordability becomes more of a challenge, we are seeing more families saying, right, I want to live in an apartment and they're going to need a three bedroom or even a four bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and yet developers haven't been typically building them to accommodate. So there's there's those sorts of that scarce asset, the view, um, having a really good outdoor space, mm -hmm. strata property, you get yeah. something that's got a really good outdoor space as well, then that's that's that could potentially do very, very well. So there's all these elements that, yes, you look for much vastly um, more complex than simply saying land is where the value is and so therefore you should only buy houses. And we have to re-educate a lot of our clients, a lot of investor clients the first time when they come to us, they often believe that and we have to say, okay, well, let's sit down and look at some case studies mm. um, as to, well, for your budget, what compromises you'll be making on that actual house. If you buy a house, what will you be making on an apartment? Um, you can actually get a better quality apartment that will do better. Mm. And do you find that people have perhaps an aversion to looking into apartments or strata, as they might say, uh, because they hear horror stories, because they don't understand the structure of how it works, because they think levies, they think bylaws, they think, oh, that's not really where I want to go. Are you still hearing that from buyers? Yeah, you definitely hear that thing about, oh, no, I don't want to buy strata because I don't want to pay levies. And I say, yeah. okay, let's look at what the levies are, you know, because as you guys all know, that's building insurance in that. There's maintenance. Okay, so even if you just look at those two things, forget gyms and pools and lifts and 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 all those amenities. Let's look at just fundamentally what it's going to cost you to, to uh, run a building, uh, run a house effectively. Yeah. And, yes, it's not budgeted for. You have the discretion over when you make those repairs and when you do that, carry out that maintenance. But I would argue, as a as, as an investor, or even as an owner occupier, you've got to treat your asset like it is an investment, like an asset, and you've got to look after it. So, um, you know, I, I've done the the costings on my own investment portfolio, and I have to say that roughly speaking, your costs associated with if it's an investor, that is. Um, your costs associated with um, holding that property, forgetting your interest costs, you know, the property management, your insurance, your, your um, what else you got to do, <laughs> repairs and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It adds up to roughly around 22 to 25% of your rental income are the costs. And that's sort of, that's across the board. Houses yeah. roughly cost the same to maintain. But your rental income on a house often isn't as good as mm. it is on a strata property in terms of the yield. So mm -hmm. there's a definite advantages for um, for investors to consider strata over a house. Yeah. And I do think uh, there is a level of additional education that either um, willingly or unwillingly comes along with buying into strata mm. for the first time. I think you are, and all of you who are here will have heard this from me, uh, the more that you know, the more that you understand, um, then the greater benefit you can get from owning a strata apartment, from being in a community. Um, knowledge really is power when it comes to those kinds of investments because it, it, it is a complex area. And if, uh, you know, I use the example often, uh, the first two-bedroom apartment that I bought uh, it, we had the space, the driveway space out the front of the garage as it was a four-storey red brick walk-up, mm -hmm. um, 12 lots odd. Uh, and 
we had the space out the front of the old garages and I said, uh, people were parking there anyway and no one had a problem, everyone had space outside their garage. Uh, and I said, why don't we pass a bylaw giving everybody exclusive use to that area of the common property and then you can legally be advertising your apartments when it comes time to sell as having two car spaces. We have one on title and we have one pursuant to an exclusive use bylaw which can't be changed without your written consent. Oh. Fabulous idea. We all just added about 40 grand to our apartment value. Uh, and that was something that because I had expertise in that, I could draft the bylaw, get it registered. It was all done and dusted. Uh, and I remember having having dinner with my husband one night going, oh, just got us a new car space and, and added tens of thousands of dollars to our investment. That kind of knowledge is incredibly valuable. And, yes. and, it's, and it's not something that should be limited to lawyers. Uh, if you have, a, as we do here, the access to that information, um, then you can be making those kinds of decisions to benefit everyone in your community. Absolutely. And we often look at buildings where there might be some opportunity for that, you know, mm. maybe whether they, they could go up into the roof cavity or, or exactly. you know, there's, there's areas that, that have been used, uh, you know, uh, pre preaching the converted here. But I do love to look at those opportunities that have not been even considered by the uh, owners to date. And, yes, you need a bit of um, inside info, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, know where to find it. Know where to find it. But I find, um, I, I find also that um, there's a certain type of person that should never buy into Strata. Tell me about that person. <laughs> tell me more. Do we know some of those? The anarchist. <laughs> The anarchist. The okay. anarchist should never, never buy into strata. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, look, from an investor's point of view, I quite often recommend strata because it's there's two layers of management. So you get a good property manager and then you've also, you make sure you get a building with a good strata manager mm. then and, and good owners corporation, all that sort of stuff. And whilst I would encourage investors to also get on the committee, you know, they often don't want to. They're just sit and forget, yes. um, which can be a problem, obviously, for a building. Um, I recognise that as well. But... Um, you know, I encourage people to to look at that because I think, you know, you really don't have to worry too much if you're actually in a building that you, you your individual lot is being well looked after by your property manager and the building itself is being uh, well looked after. But, that, you know, there are others who are no, as look, you know, you guys deal with it all day long. But, I mean, I think certainly owners who feel like they just should be able to do whatever they want to their property, they're probably not, they should probably live on acreage anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Others may say that the control freak is not a great person to have in a totally. strata building either. So much depends on um, the the melding of the personalities, I mm. think. I often say that I'm lucky uh, the place where I live now, and I live in a, a three-bedroom apartment that we live in, uh, I have been so lucky to come into a community that has been welcoming of me mm. and my ideas and uh, my suggestions and recommendations has been quite willing uh, <laughs> to take those up. Uh, for somebody like me, obviously this is what I live and breathe and, and my um, my team in the office tells me, Amanda, you, you knock off work to go lay bricks. How's that for you? Um, mm -hmm. I, I could have unknowingly purchased into an apartment where, where the committee just said, no, nah, don't want to bar of you, don't like you, don't like your ideas, you think you you know it, well, well let's sell you. Uh, that would have been really difficult. So uh, I think the control freaks of the world and, of the world and those strata experts out there uh, <laughs> need to be careful. And it's difficult to really assess the personalities. I mean, you know, yeah. we read strata reports all the time and sometimes it's a bit clear, you know, sometimes they can't help themselves and it's really obvious, but other yeah. times it's, it is really difficult to really see beyond just the information. Yeah. Uh, so there's always an element of risk and it's the same with, you know, if you're buying a house and, and some of our clients say, oh, do you knock on the neighbor's door and try to see if they're psychopaths? And it's like, well, I could, but they'd be putting on their best behavior, wouldn't they? And yeah. it's I not until something that. upsets them that you actually find out the truth anyway. So yeah. that there's all that's back to that risk, isn't it? There's mm. always risk. It doesn't matter where you are buying into, uh, the neighbors may make your life hell. Mm. Or you might make their life hell. Um, mm. And so we've all, it doesn't matter whether you, you know, I think in a way you, you're more protected with strata because there's actually some rules in place around behaviour. But if you're, you know, in a street with a, in a row of terraces, for instance, and you've got neighbours that like to have parties till 4am, yeah. yeah, you can keep calling the cops, but it's not going to be much fun. Yeah, and it could really go either way in Strata. Yes, we have this very unusual, unique power when it, when we look at it from a property law perspective to be able to pass these binding laws, mm. these bylaws that bind our neighbours. 
private citizens making laws for private to yeah. govern private citizens. It's kind of cuckoo crazy, um, which allows you to do some wonderful things. And yes, gives you this level of control if, if you're the one who's setting the terms and getting everybody to comply, but can also be quite scary if you're building the majority of people in your building want a certain thing to happen. They want, uh, they want to have short term letting, they want to uh, make an improvement to the common property that's going to cost a lot of money. They want to raise levies, uh, whatever it is, the majority Majority rules. That's the way the democratic process works in Strata. Uh, it can be um, confronting to be in that situation. Yeah, as you, you mentioned short-term letting, and you mentioned uh, new legislation there earlier, which is rather interesting because you know, uh, uh, look, you know, I, I feel a bit. I don't like those real opportunistic sort of investors. I don't like those sort of mm -hmm. person, to be quite honest. Mm. Um, you know the people that have been out there just trying to screw screw the deals and and get more and more yield and it's almost yeah. it's a little artificial it's very cynical and now they're all flooding the rental market with their stock and upsetting and and destabilizing the traditional uh rental market as well yeah. so um it's going to be interesting to see how quickly airbnb sort of rears its ugly head again if you like you want yes. to call it that um yep. post covid 19 yeah, well, I, I don't know if you um, saw, uh, I, it might have been a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about it on the live, Veronica, um, but had also posted on LinkedIn and on this page that Airbnb had sent uh, an email out to all of its New South Wales hosts, just letting them know that they were aware that this new law was starting in New South Wales that was going to give owners corporations the ability to pass a bylaw that restricted um, short-term letting in certain situations. And it reminded its hosts that because of COVID-19, it would be difficult for buildings to convene meetings to pass these bylaws. Uh, and I just read that and went, oh, that is just really quite disgusting, uh, I have to say. Oh. And, you know, like you, I say what I think. Uh, I, I thought it was uh, Airbnb getting involved where it need not, um, but that's been the response so far. And I too am interested to see how many buildings will see take up this option of passing bylaws that in effect ban investor owners from short-term letting their apartments and what impact they may have and, and what uh, routes Airbnb may take next to tackle that one. Mm, very interesting. Um, I just also, I mean, you've, you've got, we're going to have an oversupply of accommodation in in, um, in terms of hotels and all the rest of it. So yeah. it, it's, I also think, you know, just the, the sheer volume of, we keep, we keep hearing that there's an oversupply, uh, sorry, an undersupply of um, stock. Mm. Um, and yet we have very high rental uh, vacancy rates until sort of around about the end of last year, they yeah. started slowing down. And that's obviously brought about by a lot of new new construction being completed. But, you know, so, and that really has had a downward pressure on rents in Sydney anyway for some time. And then you get this influx of new stock. And I think so in a way, this idea of undersupply, it's a bit of a furphy, yeah. you know, to think, well, there's actually a lot of supply out there that hasn't really properly been available mm. so it's going to it's going to impact yields for a while and and i just wonder whether they'll um i wonder whether a lot of those owners will actually sell to be mm -hmm. honest yeah so yeah but whether they have the sort of stock that you want to buy <laughs> yeah very good point <laughs> Uh, I'm just heading over to the comments to catch up here. Uh, I'm seeing Henry saying the biggest regret that he has about buying new is the letting agency appointed by the developer was a rack and stack agency who didn't care about who they let into the apartments. Yeah, interesting. I think you're in, are you in Victoria, I think, Henry? You'll tell me if I'm wrong there. Uh, with these new builds and having these letting agreements, um, something mm. definitely to be aware of yes. as, an, as a, uh, a purchaser. Uh, Sean has said, working from home at the time, I attended most open houses as a committee member mm -hmm. when a neighbour sold to answer questions about the building bylaws. I wasn't a strata manager. <laughs> Love you, Sean. Well, I know from the purchaser, they found it useful. You're the best. Love it. And now you're a strata manager. So there you go. That was your training. Uh, I do want to just let everybody know we have about 10 minutes left of our happy hour, and I'm more than happy to answer some strata questions for you. Uh, the week's COVID questions, I always like to leave time for that. So I will have a quick scan back up above as well. But if you've got those questions, feel free to put them in the chat uh, and we can enlist our property expert Veronica Morgan here as well while we've got her uh, and also on that topic of short-term letting I did say at the beginning of the video and many more of you have come in since then uh, I am making my template short-term letting bylaw available uh, it, it, it's 
not a stuff for you to Airbnb, uh, though you might <laughs> read between the lines there. Uh, you can get a copy of that over at yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash bylaw offer. And the inside tip there is that you will also see the membership doors that are open. The Your Strata Property membership, uh, usually on wait list, but I have opened the doors just until midnight on Sunday night. So would love to see you all inside the membership. I know a number of you here are already in, which is awesome. Uh, Michelle is saying, I once lived in a standalone house with dreadful neighbours with vicious dogs. It was a nightmare. Council did nothing. Would have been better in strata with bylaws. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because mm. um, you, you can, because you can say no pets, no animals. You can regulate the keeping of animals in a strata building. But if you live in a, in a semi-detached and the dogs are barking mm. all day and the kids are bouncing their basketballs and the parties are happening, ain't nothing you can do about it. Mm. Uh, Gail bought into a nightmare as the executive committee purposely left off the minutes, the fact that there's almost $200,000 worth of water ingress problems. Strata reports aren't worth the paper they're written on. How many times mm -hmm. do we hear that, Veronica, that yes. you've done the strata search? And I it's think just we actually did a, a, I interviewed Rena for the podcast and we talked about that, you know, oh. what actually goes into a strata report and what's missing. And, and I know that even just following some of your episodes on your podcast, you know, I, we've actually... I keep reviving or re, uh, re, reviewing, I should say, our templates for when we're reviewing these these um, reports, and that most of them are useless. Uh, well, yeah. they're useless if you read them at face value. They're very useful if you look well. What's missing? And now we need to go and ask these questions. And you have to know what's missing. You have to That's know what's missing. Yeah, missing. it's not yeah. a ticking exercise, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it's not. It's, and it's definitely worth that investment to get someone who knows their stuff, whether it's your conveyancer, property lawyer, strata lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a consultant strata manager who can go in and do a search for you and really understand what's in there. Uh, Elizabeth, at what point would repair and maintenance works be considered unreasonably delayed from a legal and insurance perspective? Really great question, Elizabeth. I'm not sure what state you're in, but if you are in New South Wales, uh, then we do have a very strict uh, mandatory, absolute, non-negotiable, immediate duty to repair and maintain our common property. So the answer is there should be no delay. As a matter of law, the minute the owners corporation is aware, uh, and it's even arguable whether they need to be aware or not, uh, that there is a, a need to repair and maintain the common property, then they should be on it. They should be doing it uh, at risk of an owner being able to claim their loss and damage from them. So there's never uh, an assessment, at least in New South Wales, of whether a delay has been reasonable or unreasonable. You just should not be delaying at all, should be carrying out those works. Uh, and as I said last week, we do not have law yet, uh, and nor is it on the horizon from our federal government or our state governments saying that construction work uh, or repair work, any kind of maintenance work should be stopping anywhere, whether on our strata buildings, on our building sites, uh, they, they, that is all the type of work that is continuing. Uh, and I do feel very uncomfortable about building strata buildings who, for whatever reason, are telling owners or telling contractors that works shouldn't be continuing or shouldn't be commencing. Uh, I think it's important that um, we acknowledge that is not the law. Uh, it should be continuing. And um, there are precautions and, and steps that can be put in place to make sure that all residents are kept safe and healthy at this time. And I'm seeing some great contractors doing those things with uh, safe work method statements and setting out exactly how they're going to um, deal with residents and team members and things like that. Uh, so Zlata, what happens to all the old bylaws on short-term letting? Another excellent question. If you're in New South Wales, you want to review your bylaws. If you have a bylaw in place for short-term letting, uh, it may now be in breach of section 137A because we can't have a bylaw that prevents resident owners where it is their principal place of residence. We can't actually prevent them from short-term letting their lots. Okay. So we we can only prevent investor owners. And a lot of you probably do. I was drafting these bylaws. A lot of you probably do have bylaws that just prevent short-term letting full stop. Um, my template only deals with the investor owners. They're the only ones that we can be regulating now when it comes to short-term letting. So um, I don't know if this was intentional or not. Some lawyers are writing about this saying it's a loophole. Um, but um, even in buildings where uh, the local council planning instruments may uh, prohibit short-term letting. We now have strata law that says you can't prohibit it if it is an owner's principal place of residence. So that's a really um, interesting, from a legal perspective, 
conflict there between our strata law and our local planning law. And it might be that you cannot be pursuing these uh, breaches if it is an owner who is letting their principal place of residence. You can't pursue those through NCAT or through your bylaws, but you have to go directly to the local council and go through the land and environment court and say that that's a breach of the planning instrument if it is an, a resident owner, short-term letting. So the system has suddenly become very complex for owners who want to deal with this problem. So don't you think it's a bit of a shame actually for the, the investor owner and the way in which they've approached, um, well, some of them, not all of them, of course, have, have actually approached or some of the, the um, volume of, of tenancy they might have had coming through or traffic coming through their properties has actually created a situation where owners are discriminated against and lost an opportunity to potentially actually earn some income from their property should they go overseas or should they take a temporary transfer somewhere for argument's sake or should they want to just do a bit of house swapping. It, it's yeah. actually a shame, isn't it, because that's a sort of flexibility that would be nice to be able to offer owners but, you know, when you've got those properties that are available, at, you know, 365 days a year or 180 days a year, depending on yeah. where the legislation's at. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's quite an imposition on the rest of the building, isn't it? Yes. Well, and, and that's what Airbnb says, that we we are, have always been a sharing uh, platform and, and it's, it has been set up for people mm. to share their homes and they shouldn't be prevented from doing that. Um, at the moment in, in New South Wales, they're not owners who, who want to go overseas and have somebody in their property while they're away. They're not prevented from doing that and we can't pass a bylaw that prevents that. Uh, but there is going to be state environmental planning policy, a new set uh, that says that there would be a cap on the number of nights mm. that owners who are using the property as a principal place of residence could actually do that. And there's also going to be a new fire safety standard introduced that requires, uh, and this is where these resident owners might get tripped up, requires um, things like fire extinguishers in properties, fire mm. blankets, strip lighting, uh, smoke alarms in every room wired to the mains, uh, quite a high standard, I think, of fire mm. safety um, because the property is going to be used for short-term letting, whether it's a, a limited amount of time or whether it's full-time. Um, so that'll be interesting to see that play out. I am just heading back over to the comments. Henry saying, yes, he is in Victoria. I thought so. Thank you, Henry. Uh, the government's moved the pendulum too far in favour of the tenant and made the relationship between landlord and tenant an issue of oppressed and oppressor. There, whoa, there we go. Uh, should the strata search, Bruce asks, include emails to and from the strata manager? Absolutely. This is my bone of contention, uh, Bruce, and you've probably heard this from me before. Uh, I don't know why emails are not in the files. Strata managers, please put your emails in the files. If I, if I ever come to your office, strata managers, and do a strata search, and you ain't got the emails in there, I'll tell you what, you, you get my template letter because uh, I've sent it so many times. Most don't, I'll tell oh, you, most course. don't. Mm. There is just this concept of, oh, but they're emails. One strata manager asked, I said, where's the email? The correspondence file has four things in it for the year. And he said, but Amanda, there's hundreds of emails. I said, yeah, and I want to see them. Of course there's that. So there should be hundreds of emails. It's not a reason not to give it to mm. me. And the emails is where the gold is. You know, we've mm. talked about that before. That is where you're going to find out what is going on day to day. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for being here. Lovely to see you, Deb, from the ACT, saying thank you to all of our, our work. Uh, she says that you don't seem, I don't seem to be a fan of short-term letting. Uh, it's not so much not a fan of short-term letting. Uh, it, it is um, the fact that it, when Airbnb came out the other week, Deb, and said this is what the New South Wales strata law says and you don't have to worry about it, owners, because, because of this uh, horrible pandemic that is affecting everybody, your building can't actually have a meeting and pass a bylaw. So rest assured, uh, the, the law that they quoted was wrong and it was just quite gross, really. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of understanding the laws that are available to you. And I do hear uh, quite regularly from communities that are so impacted, adversely impacted by short-term letting in their buildings when they have bought into what they thought was a residential building with no commercial activities whatsoever. Uh, and they have, uh, if, they, if they wanted to engage in short-term letting, would have bought a service department they would have bought a building that was set up for that um, so I do think a number of buildings have uh, an issue uh, problems with short-term letting when the tools are available to deal with that then I'm going to be the first one to tell you that those tools are available and how you can use them effectively whether you use them or not is entirely up to you uh, Sean is saying can the council chase 
the ADA be breach on an owner or occupier. Um, yes, I understand that they can, Sean. The difficulty here, and that's what I was mentioning earlier, uh, is that it could only be the council who could pursue the ADA-B breach. Uh, if we have an instrument, if we have a planning instrument that says we, we can't short-term let, um, we can't have a bylaw anymore that reflects the ADA-B, whereas before we could, um, because the, our Strata Act now says you simply cannot prevent in, um, owners where it's their principal place of residence from short-term letting, even if you have an 88B that says that you can't. So I think that's a bit confusing. Uh, now, we are shortly going to wrap up our happy hour. And I do, Veronica, want to give you the opportunity to share with us uh, any resources that you think our um, viewers today would benefit from. In particular, I want you to share with us uh, your book, uh, which has a very colourful title. And I, I'm not going to attempt to relay it. I'm going to leave that up to you. Tell us about the book. Well, the book's called Auction Ready, How to Buy Property at Auction Even Though You're Scared Shitless. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, look, it's predominantly aimed at people on the eastern states because that's where the more auction-oriented uh, parts of our country are, certainly Sydney and Melbourne and, and to a degree Brisbane. And, and I was driven to write this because I just see so many people go to auction completely and utterly unprepared and often I see them couples in particular, debating with each other as to whether they should continue bidding or not. And so they haven't even agreed on their limit. The and it time. happens all the time. So, so yes, so you can definitely, um, uh, there's a, I'll thank you for the link up there. So getauctionready.com.au is how to get that. Or you can go onto my website, which is gooddeeds.com.au and there's a tab there. And look, I haven't gone, I haven't been very good with this, but um, normally I actually put together a, a little uh, coupon. So to give you a 30% discount. So if anybody wants to buy the book, I haven't got one for this, but you can use, I'll cheat and use, you can use elephant. Has that put elephant when it comes to discount code, you'll get 30% off the book. Nice. Um, so, you know, I look, I, I find auctions fascinating. I find the psychology of them fascinating. I, I'm, I really, really, really enjoy auctions and I enjoy watching people do crazy things at auctions, but that's sort of more from a scientific point of view. From my my buyer's agent side of me is heartbroken when I see people do some of the stuff that they do at auctions. So I certainly, I just, um, there's a lot in that book to help people prepare so that they don't make mistakes. They don't get hoodwinked by what, the whole structure of an auction, but also the way the agents and auctioneers work, work buyers, but also they don't get fooled by price guides, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and also what I've been working on is um, not yet launched, but you can actually, there's a little mini course for people who want to learn how to price a property, how to work out the right price to pay. And that is because we're working on, I'm working on um, building an online platform of support for first home buyers. First home buyers, as I mentioned earlier, are often a sort of, funnel down that sort of house and land package or the brand new apartment package. It's so dangerous because if first home buyers don't get that first property right, yeah. they can screw up their entire financial future. So I really sort of driven by a passion to help first home buyers not make these crazy mistakes and not get sort of pushed into by, by governments, by spruikers, by developers into, into areas of great risk. So I've got a little free mini course helping people price a property which is on homebuyeracademy.com.au forward slash free course, okay? So that, that's in there. And we will be launching, I'm aiming at launching that in June, in July, actually. So it will be an online course and also a mentoring program for first home buyers. So if you want to know about that and sort of get into the early bird, um, I'm going to be doing some demo stuff. Uh, then get onto that website, homebuyeracademy.com.au and you can register for early bird notification. And no better time to be running an online course uh, in our current climate, as we say. Uh, and I know there is a number of you here, uh, I'm just sort of working out the demographics in my mind. When we're talking about first home buyers, uh, if you've got kids, if you've got nieces and nephews, uh, if you've got family members, uh, I've certainly shared Veronica's material across to my family members who found it useful um, in their search. So don't forget to send that one on as well. And I can see, thank you, Rochelle, has just put that link in the notes for us. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so can I just add one oh, thing? And obviously yeah. I, I'm gathering most people that are listening to this would be uh, listening to your pro podcast and I tell everybody listen to that who, who's interested in Strata or owns or wants to buy in Strata, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, we've, we've actually got a few COVID 
19 episodes on the Elephant in the Room podcast, uh, we've interviewed some really um, interesting people uh, to get to get the lowdown and to get some real data and real understanding of what happens with this sort of crisis as well and what's likely to happen to the property market rather than the hype and the fear and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, we've, we've been putting out special coronavirus episodes uh, over the past few weeks. So I just encourage people to, to subscribe by iTunes or Spotify. Um, if you're on Android, and listen to some of those, particularly if you're worried about what's happening uh, in the market. And look, none of us know, mm. but at least that way you can get a little bit of fact and a little bit of history and a little bit of, of um, evidence-based um, knowledge to actually start sort of calming yourself down and working out what you th- what really is likely to happen when it all when we get through the end of this. Yeah, which is definitely what we all need. A bit of, a bit of calm, a bit of an eye on the future. Uh, I think we are definitely this week. Uh, I mean, I walk down the street and I can see more people are out. There are mm. a few more people at the shops. So there's definitely a level of comfort that's now coming through. Uh, good or bad, we have to be careful of that, but definitely a time to start thinking about what the future might hold mm. for all of us. Uh, and your podcast, The Elephant in the Room, uh, is always an excellent one, COVID or no COVID. Um, <laughs> definitely worth checking out all of those episodes there uh but thank you so much veronica for being our special guest today uh i can't cheers. believe Oops. yeah cheers. cheers i don't know that you might not have got through very much that. wine there's a lot of talking there for you um thank you for sharing um these hours just go past so fast and i think it, we're up to the sixth week of happy hour uh, i'm seeing more and more of you here every week and so i'm feeling like it's something that you would like me to keep doing uh it was something that i started when the world went a bit topsy-turvy and i felt like you might need some social engagement with uh other special humans that i, I called you in my email today who understand this crazy world of strata um let me let me know guys what you would like uh, i'm sure you're going to say yeah we'd like to keep having happy hour um okay we'll, we'll try and keep fitting that one into the schedule um but i, I am uh, often focused on what's happening with my members inside the membership community so i am uh quite um jealous of that time if you like and like to preserve that time um so if you enjoy the one-on-one uh if you are interested in getting your hands on the short-term template and the other templates I've got in the library then definitely this weekend is the time to get into the membership and I'm just going to say uh, if you're enjoying the happy hour uh, lives as well then the membership is a great place to be so I'm not quite sure what we'll do with the lives um, but definitely um, members are at the top of the list there so uh, yourstrataproperty.com.au forward slash bylaw offer if you want to check out the bylaw template and the membership this weekend before the doors shut again uh, lovely to see you uh, Gary's just popped up hello and Nathan is saying thank you lovely to see you and Elizabeth this is a great service we love to be of service to you Elizabeth thanks for joining us everybody thank you Veronica uh, enjoy your quiet weekend once more. Thanks, Amanda. See you. See you.